Hello, it's one o'clock, it's Friday. Welcome to the Socialist Party's Facebook Live this week. It's on capitalism, crisis and class division. And very shortly, I'm going to be joined by Hannah Sell, the Socialist Party General Secretary, to discuss this uh, topic. So we're, we're here on Friday, 8th of May, in anticipation of uh, Tory Prime Minister Boris Johnson making an announcement on Sunday on the next phase of the lockdown. And what we've had is a very sharp message shift, really, over the last uh, period from stay at home to save the NHS to get ready to go back to work to save the economy. But it's against a background of the death toll from COVID continuing to rise, uh, of the PPE uh, provision crisis far from solved, and also uh, the testing shambles uh, not solved either. And as we've been saying in all these Facebook Lives and in the material that we produce as the Socialist Party, everything about this crisis points to the class nature of society that we live in. That society is dominated by two main classes, the working class on the one hand and on the other hand, the capitalist class, big business. And we're asking at each point whose interests are being served, whose interests, which class's interests are being served by the push back to work, just like which class's interests were served uh, by Johnson's and the Tories' delayed response in the first place. So I'm going to be talking to Hannah about how the Socialist Party sees things, the socialist perspective for the next stages, and also asking what are the tasks for the working class when we're going to defend our interests in this situation and the crisis as it goes forward. We're going to do our normal thing, though, before we start, which is to ask you to help build the audience on a... a uh, bank holiday, obviously, so hopefully some of you are out enjoying uh, the weather, but others are watching, um, and that you will help us to build the audience, post the names of your friends and workmates and family members in the comments below to try and draw them in to watch the video, host a watch party, or um, you know share the link to this video on pages that you're uh, involved in, and so on. Um, but, but more than that, we hope that you'll comment. We always say this, but we want to hear from you. What are your questions? What are your thoughts? What do you think about what we're saying? Post in the comments below, but better, better still, get in touch with the Socialist Party. Every week, the Socialist Party is hosting 60 or 70 Zoom meetings across the country, which our members are discussing all sorts of uh, political issues at and organising where possible. And, we, you know, you, you should join us if you're interested in what we're saying. And if you're outside England and Wales, get in touch and we'll link you up with our sister parties in the CWI, the Committee for a Workers' International, the Socialist World Organisation that we're part of. Uh, as I mentioned, today is a bank holiday. It's a new bank holiday for VE Day, and that's a day that should be marked by socialists. Uh, in this week's issue of uh, the Socialist Paper, there's a lot of very good material that you can read, but it includes um, a really good letter um, which makes the point that every time you speak to someone who was um, involved, you know, from the generation who lived through that war, that you, you learn something. Um, but we have to ask, what is happening to many of those heroes today, many of those heroes who defeated fascism? Many have been, sadly and brutally, surrendered to this crisis, left unprotected to die in privatised care homes. We're ask, you know, we ask as well, what is the real story of what happened in 1945? And I would point you to the website, actually, of the uh, CWI, socialistworld.net, where there's some articles being posted today that tell that real story. And in the letter in The Socialist, it's remembered that while today Churchill is uh, celebrated as a, as a hero, it was the, work, you know, the working class threw him out of power um, uh, and a Labour government was voted in that was forced to nationalise 20% of the economy, set up the NHS, the NHS that today the Tories clap, but at the time opposed. And that government also, of course, built council housing, which is much needed uh, today, uh, given the uh, overcrowding crisis and the, the vulnerability that that gives people to the virus. Um, so... You know, today, like then, we're faced with crisis, with capitalist crisis, and again, it's the working class that is expected to pay the price. 
And we'd say the best way that we can honour that generation, those heroes, is to remember the dead, yes, but also fight for the living by learning the lessons that that generation bequeathed us of working class struggle, of a fight for socialist change. And so that's why it's also really important that we are having this discussion today to start a discussion on the socialist perspective for the next phase of this crisis because like everything, if we leave it in the hands of the Tories and the boss class that they represent, we know that what that will mean for the suffering of millions of people. So we're here today to give a socialist viewpoint to the next phase, as we can anticipate it. Um, and when we get the OK from our tech staff, um, we're going to uh, get going. And we've just had the thumbs up. So let's, let's kick off properly then. And hopefully people are watching. Uh, so hello, welcome to this week's Socialist Party Facebook Live. It's uh, Friday the 8th of May. I'm Sarah Sachs Eldridge. I'm the Socialist Party National Organiser. I'm going to be putting questions to Hannah Sell, Socialist Party General Secretary, um, about what we can expect from the next phase of the crisis. Hannah is the author of the main feature article in this month's Socialism Today magazine, which is on Britain's special COVID crisis, and I'd urge you to read that. It's available on the Socialist Party uh, website, but I'd urge you to subscribe as well to our monthly magazine, Socialism Today. A lot of very good articles in, in there. But without further ado, because I've been rambling on a bit now trying to get things sorted, I'll kick off with the questions for Hannah. Hello, Hannah. Thanks for speaking to us today. Hi, Sarah. So first question. Uh, as I said, Johnson is going to be making an announcement on Sunday. Obviously, for some people, the lockdown has brought suffering due to loss of income, loss of the support that they need, and so on. But we still have a rising death toll, albeit at a slightly slower rate. So do you think, are the Tories right to start easing the lockdown now, and if, if that is what they're going to do? I mean, as you've said, we still have a rising death toll, and as I think everybody will have seen, we now have, on the official deaths, the highest number of deaths in Europe. And as we all also know, that unfortunately is not the real figure. The actual death toll is considerably higher. There have been surveys done that have looked at the number of people who've died compared to what is normal at this time of the year in 24 countries across Europe, and there again, Britain is higher above the normal level than any other country in Europe. And the Financial Times, for example, has estimated that something like 50,000 people have died in Britain as a result of COVID-19. And unsurprisingly, deaths are highest in the poorest parts of the country. In my own borough in Newham in London, we had a socially distanced car cavalcade last night which was protesting for PPE, for the workforce, but was also protesting against austerity and for decent housing because Newham has the highest number of deaths in the country. And the reason for that, it's not a surprise, it is one of the two poorest boroughs in London. It has the worst overcrowding in housing in London. And at the same time, many of the people who work in Newham do jobs in the health sector, in social care, as bus drivers, as refuse workers, the jobs where people are most at risk because they're having to still work and they don't have sufficient protection. So, so look, the working class are suffering the worst from this virus and we're continuing to suffer. But after seven weeks, that doesn't mean it's a simple question for people because we also suffer the worst effects of the lockdown. And that is millions of people who have lost income, millions who can't afford to feed their families in the situation in the lockdown. And the general problem, even if you've still got income, that if you are living in overcrowded accommodation, looking after your children at home without access to outdoor space is a nightmare. It is much harder for students from working class families who don't have a laptop each and decent space to study, to continue their studies at home and so on and so forth. So I think generally speaking, working class people feel divided mm. about whether the lockdown should continue or in what form it should continue. But still, overall, opinion polls at the moment show 
a big majority of people think it is too early to lift the lockdown, do not think schools should go back yet, even less think that restaurants and pubs and other things should open again, and are reacting to the blatant shift in propaganda by the Tories. I mean, honestly, you think about what we had from the Tory party, but also from the BBC, everybody's got to stay at home, and then an attempt really to blame individuals for being too close to somebody else in a park or whatever for the spread of the virus as a distraction from the reality that the government had not prepared for a pandemic, was not carrying out sufficient testing, did not have stocks of PPE, and so on. So you had that blatant wave of propaganda, and now you're having blatantly the opposite wave of propaganda. You know, the chair of the 1922 committee, the Tory backbench committee, openly saying people have got too used to being furloughed. They're too comfy staying at home. They've all, it's now your national duty to go back to work. But people are mainly reacting to that propaganda drive by saying, no, we're not sure about this. And the reason for that is because they rightly don't trust this Tory government to take decisions in the interests of the majority. And look, there are divisions within the Tory party and they reflect divisions within the capitalist class, within the elite in this country, about when and how to lift the lockdown. And that reflects the fact that having failed to prepare for a pandemic, having a health service which has been cut to the bone, lack of stocks of PPE and so on, they don't have any easy way forward. But while they're divided, what they're divided about is not do we protect the economy or do we protect the lives of ordinary people? What they're divided about is how best to protect the economy. And by that, they don't mean our jobs and wages. They mean their profits and looking after the capitalist system. And those that are pushing to not open up yet are worried about a second wave and the effects of that on the economy rather than looking after our health per se. And we only have to look back to how this Tory government reacted in the first place to the pandemic to know their real motivations, because their initial response was to do nothing. The lockdown was late in Britain because they thought they could get away with a position of waiting for herd immunity. That meant allowing hundreds of thousands of people potentially to die, to, as Dominic Cummings famously put it, much as it was denied, herd immunity, protect the economy, and if that means some pensioners die, too bad. That was their initial position. And they were forced into a rapid U-turn only because they saw that as the rest of Europe locked down, there would be a mass movement in Britain that they could be booted out of office if they weren't seen to take action. But that action has been inadequate because of the whole history of running down the health service, the lowest number of intensive care beds in Europe, which meant that we were not prepared to deal properly with a, a pandemic. And now, in moving to ease the lockdown, they're once again protecting the economy, by which they mean the capitalist system. They don't mean public health. And therefore, it's vital that at this stage, where there is a change taking place, we don't know exactly what Johnson's going to announce, but it will at least be an easing of parts of the lockdown and a preparation to go further, then it's vital that the trade union movement, the workers' movement, launches a serious struggle to defend workers' rights in this latest stage of the corona crisis, to look after the health of the population. The government's briefings were leaked on ways in which they could open up the economy. In all seven documents, these were leaked last weekend, so quite close to these announcements, in all seven documents there was a headline PPE and underneath it said guidance to follow. They're proposing to start opening the economy with no idea what they're going to say on PPE. And let's be clear, the reason it says guidance to follow is because they know they don't have enough PPE to carry out safe measures. On social distancing, the guidelines that they publish say it will not always be possible to keep a distance of two metres. In these circumstances, both employers and employees 
must do everything they reasonably can to reduce risk. The reasonably can is an leaves an enormous space for employers to do whatever they can get away with. This is advice to allow employers to risk the health of the majority of the population of their workforce in a return to work. We know, for example, that the employers on London Underground, London Underground Limited, have been openly arguing two metres isn't social distancing, half a metre is social distancing, purely in order that they can get London Underground up and running again. Now, the guidance was so clearly a charter for risking workers' health that the leadership of the TUC, the leadership of the trade unions in Britain, who up until now have unfortunately gone along with the idea that we're all in this together and a big part of their job is to act as loyal supporters of the government's approach to the Covid crisis, said on this occasion, we want to be able to recommend the government's approach to safe working, but as it stands, we cannot. Too right, they cannot. But of course, it's not enough to just not recommend it. The question is, what is the trade union movement going to do about it? And in our view, the TUC needs to call an urgent council of war, which says a return to work is conditional on their demands being met. And what should those demands be? Well, actually, most of them are on the front of the socialist here. PPE and testing for all. No to return to work unless safety can be guaranteed. And workers and trade union control of workplace safety. And that is what is necessary in order to allow an easing of the lockdown. We cannot, people don't trust the Tories to do it and they're right not to trust the Tories to do it. We need the workers' movement to take an independent stance. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and you've made the point there very clearly that the Tories are prioritising the economy. By that, they mean capitalist profits. But whatever is announced on Sunday, it's absolutely clear, isn't it, that the economy has taken a huge hit from this lockdown. And the point that we've made in the Socialist Party, it's obvious, but it's got to be brought, brought out, is that it wasn't in a great state before this crisis. Should we be assured, though, or reassured, when Johnson says things like, oh, I don't like the word austerity, that more brutal cuts aren't in store for us? Well, it would be nice to be reassured, <laughs> but uh, I don't think we can be. Um, and uh, as Sarah said, we were heading into a recession anyway before the COVID crisis. There was no growth in the British economy in the last quarter of 2019. But the Bank of England this week has now said that we are heading into the sharpest downturn, the deepest recession in 300 years. That's what the Bank of England is now predicting. And they're saying that the economy will shrink by 14% in 2020 and that unemployment levels will double. So it's pretty clear capitalism in 2020 is a system in crisis. And in our view, it is also clear that it will be the working class that is expected to pay the price for that in terms of job losses, pay cuts and hardship. We've already had two million people applying for universal credit. But as the furlough scheme is phased out, it is likely, unfortunately, there will be many more who are laid off and are forced into the ranks of the unemployed. The Covid crisis is a huge shock to the system and it's upending everything, the economic, the political, the social structure of society. But we know, we live in a world where there is a tiny capitalist elite with vast amounts of wealth and power and they use every crisis to take advantage of it for their own interests. That's what they do and that is what they are doing out of this Covid crisis. So the job losses are not just because of companies who are going out of business because they're bankrupt and there's nothing else that they can do. It is also big business taking advantage of the Covid crisis in order to get their own way. Look at British Airways. 12,000 workers threatened with redundancy. But beyond that, discussion about laying off the whole of the staff or the vast majority of the staff of British Airways 
and then re-employing them on worse terms and conditions. That's what the management of British Airways have been trying to do for a decade. And now they're trying to use the Covid crisis to drive down their workers' pay and conditions. Royal Mail Management have attempted the same thing. They've been in dispute with the workforce trying to force through an undermining of the postal workers' pay and conditions, and then they use the COVID crisis to try and get it through. They've been forced to step back because of the union organisation being prepared to threaten action if they didn't retreat. But that is what they will do out of this crisis. They will try to make sure that we pay and the few people at the top will not. And the Tories will do everything possible to make sure that is the case. So that's not to say that it doesn't mean anything, Johnson saying he doesn't like the word austerity. I mean, obviously, it's partly populism. He knows that what the previous Tory governments did, the most brutal austerity since the 30s, was very unpopular. So he's trying to boost his ratings by saying he disagrees with it. But it does reflect something else as well, which is that this government has ripped up the neoliberal rule book. Remember Theresa May's magic money tree? Well, Johnson has just found the biggest magic money tree you can possibly imagine. They have bailed out the system on a giant scale, massively increased public sector spending. Things that they said were Marxist and impossible, they are now doing. But they're doing them, as we've explained in the Socialist Party, to act in the interests of the capitalist class to prop up their system rather than to look after the rest of us. And in the aftermath of this crisis, they probably won't be able to just stop that huge public expenditure because if they did, the crisis of capitalism would be too deep. And therefore, they can keep going with public expenditure but it will be to prop up big business, the rest of us will still be expected to pay for the crisis. So it will be a different form of austerity. In that sense, it's a change, but not a change in terms of what it means for the majority, because they really do never act in our interests. Look even at the nationalisation that has taken place during this crisis and contrast and compare. Have they nationalised the private hospitals? so that they can be taken over to help deal with the crisis? No, they've rented beds off them at cost price. Have they nationalised the railways? Effectively, yes. But they've left the existing private companies in charge and paid them to keep running them. What they've really done is bailed out the private rail companies. But do they nationalise the pharmaceutical companies, who are doing very nicely out of this and making big profits, but nationalise could clearly be more effectively harnessed to meet the needs of the majority, no, I don't want to swear. They do not do that. They don't even consider doing that because what they're doing is defending the interests of their system. And, you know, there's been a lot of privatisation taking place in the health service. We have an overwhelmingly privatised social care system and the standards in that are reflected in the misery that is taking place in the social care system at the moment. Is Johnson going to learn the lessons from this and have a properly funded, nationally run, social, run by local authorities, social care system with high quality care and well paid, well trained, with good resources staff? No, they're not going to do that. They're going to continue to run with a privatised care system unless they face a mass movement to demand that they behave differently. You only have to look at what they've done with the new services that they're trying to develop like the, the test and trace technology, they're looking at giving the call centres running that to Serco, a private company that has played a terrible role in the National Health Service, that employs its workers peanuts, treats them appallingly, that's who they're going to get to run it. So any nationalisation they carry out is in the interest of big business. It is not nationalisation for the good of society under democratic workers' control and management. To get that, we're going to have to fight for it. Thanks, Hannah. And I'll just pick up again on my theme of uh, promoting socialism today, uh, this week, to point to the article on Blair's real NHS legacy, because you just mentioned there about uh, NHS privatisation, and that is a, an article very much worth reading. And actually, it brings us on to the question of the Labour Party. Mm. I think the last time that we had Hannah on the Socialist Party's Facebook uh, Lunchtime Live was just after the election of Keir Starmer. Um, this week, as the leader of the Labour Party that is, this week um, 
you know, he, he didn't have a great uh, few, few weeks of his uh, leadership, but this week he seemed to be a bit more forensic, maybe questioning um, uh, uh, Johnson on Prime Minister's uh, question time. This is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but I'm going to say to Hannah, do you think that the Socialist Party was a bit quick to judge that his victory was a defeat for the working class? I could just say no, but that would be a bit of a short answer, so I'll say a little bit more than that. I mean, first of all, OK, he did a bit better at Prime Minister's Questions this week. It, it was an open goal because the Tory, it's a complete mess, the Tories' response to this crisis, and Johnson didn't have the answers to any of Starmer's uh, forensic questions. But the week before at Prime Minister's Questions, Starmer was still saying, to quote exactly, that parts of the government's handling of the corona crisis were an amazing piece of work. That is not my idea, the Socialist Party's idea, of a trenchant opposition. And he is stepping up his criticism of the government, but the question is, in whose interests is he doing it? Who is he arguing for? After all, if you think back to the early stages of the corona crisis, who was the most effective politician arguing against the government's position? Actually, you could say it was Jeremy Hunt, because he was going on and on about testing, about not having this herd immunity nonsense. And he was right on that issue. But Jeremy Hunt was the health minister that junior doctors had to go on strike against because of his brutal Tory policies. He is no friend of the working class. And what's happening now is the national unity that was such a huge propaganda wave. Everybody's in this together. Everybody's united behind the government. It's breaking down. But it's breaking down in part because the capitalist class and the different sections of big business are divided on the way forward. And many of them are unhappy with Johnson's approach and are beginning to encourage criticism of Johnson's approach. And actually, there are big sections of big business who think that Starmer's wonderful, amazing piece of work speeches were a bit soft and that you should start criticising the Tory party more. Even Alistair Campbell, let's remember Tony Blair's spin doctor, he had a big article criticising Starmer for failing to oppose the government. So now he is standing up to the government a bit more, but he's doing it, in our view, reflecting the views of a big section of big business, including those who are pushing to open the economy. Starmer had a big interview in the Financial Times this week, and the kind of headline taken from it by the Financial Times, who are definitely pushing towards reopening the economy, was... The government were too slow to lock down and now they're too slow to open up. That was the direction in which Starmer was pushing. We have to be clear. I mean, Labour's, the ex-leader of the Labour Party, now the shadow business secretary, is still repeating the national unity mantra. So in his article in the National Press last weekend, he talked about how together state business and workers must share the risks and burdens we face. But left to the government and big business, it will be workers who shoulder all of the risks and the burdens that we face. And the crucial issue we need in an opposition is an opposition that stands up for the interests of the working class. And Starmer, Ed Miliband and the rest of them do not do that. There was an interview on the Today programme last week and Starmer was asked three times, would you support... Workers who refuse to work because they do not have enough health and safety equipment. They do not have sufficient PPE. And he refused to answer it. And that really tells you everything about whose interests Starmer is, uh, is acting in. I can't remember if it had come out at this point, but I may have mentioned this in the last time I talked about Starmer on this broadcast. But I do think it was very significant the day after he was elected, the Financial Times editorial, so the big business talking to themselves, welcomed his election, of course, a marvellous step forward, but went on to warn Starmer against joining any national unity government because they said Johnson's support is shallow and will be short-lived and therefore, you have to be prepared to step into the breach. What they mean by that is they realise the Tories' mishandling of this could see the Tories booted out of office and they want 
a government that will act in their interests if that happens, which whose hands are clean, who are not too closely associated with the current mess, and they see Starmer as being that. They see him as someone who acts in their interests exactly because he is not acting in the interests of the working class. Thanks, Hannah. And you mentioned there uh, how Ed Miliband, the former Labour Party leader, um, has picked up the Tory theme of national unity. And obviously we've explained that there is no national unity, no national interest, but different classes and different class interests that are diametrically opposed to each other. But nonetheless, uh, as you mentioned earlier in, in one of the previous answers that you gave, you made the point about how the trade unions are being consulted by the government uh, on the uh, plans to uh, ease, the, uh, ease the lockdown. So in your view, uh, does that indicate that there's a bit more substance to the idea that we're all in it together? They want the trade union leaders to act as a cover for their policies, to give them credibility. That is the only sense in which the Tories are consulting the trade union leaders. Those leaked documents, it came out later that what happened is that the TUC and the leaders of the trade unions were given 11 hours on a Sunday night to read the documents and to give their yes or no. They were just being bounced into backing those documents. They were so bad, the TUC was not bounced and they didn't correctly sign up to those documents. But they didn't go on to attack the government the way they should have done. In our view, they should have called an immediate press conference explaining how they were being bounced into try trying to get them to support this charter effectively for risking workers' health and safety, but most importantly making clear that the TUC would not support any return to work that was not done safely. And what that means is safely not as judged by Tory ministers, not as judged by CEOs of big companies, but judged by the democratic organisations of workers themselves, trade union organisations at local level in their workplaces and nationally as well. We would add to that, at the moment through this crisis, many trade union bodies, including national executives of trade unions, have not been meeting. We've always thought that was a mistake, but it is now in this new phase absolutely crucial that at every level trade union bodies start to meet urgently again to discuss how to defend their members' interests in the course of this crisis. We all know now you don't have to meet face to face. You can meet on Zoom, Skype, whatever. There's no reason that they can't have meetings in order to discuss defending their members in this key period. And we are, we are already seeing struggles at local level. Bus workers in Southampton refusing to take the buses out because they hadn't been deep cleaned. A whole host of other struggles like that developing as workers attempt to defend their health and safety. But we can see a new phase. We will see a new phase of those in the coming weeks. But we have to fight for the trade unions to coordinate that nationally in order to make it as powerful as possible. And that is also preparation, just to finish, for what is coming afterwards. Because the question of our immediate health and safety in this COVID crisis is vital, is very important. But we also know the economic catastrophe that is developing, we are going to be fighting for our health and safety, our jobs, our wages, our livelihoods in the course of the coming months and years. And we're preparing for that now. The more the working class asserts itself to defend our health and safety now, the more confidence we're going to have for the fights that are developing in the future. And we would say, if you're listening to this and you're not yet a member of a trade union, join a trade union. If you're in a trade union, get active in your union and fight to make sure that your union is acting collectively to defend your co-workers in your workplace and in your industry. Nationally, we need to fight for trade union leaders that stand in defence of our interests. But it's not just an industrial issue. We also need a political voice for the working class. We need candidates standing in elections who stand in defence of the working class, who don't go along with national unity with a Tory government that stands for the billionaires, that looks at this current crisis and says what we need is 
a socialist society where decisions really are taken on how to fight a virus, for example, not on the basis of what best suits the profits of a few at the top, but what best takes care of the health and the well-being of the majority of society. And that means a society that is run democratically by working class people. That's what socialism is really. I think during this crisis, we've seen the capability of working class people, the essential workers to keep society running, but now we have to fight for society where it's really in our hands rather than continuing to be run by a corrupt capitalist elite. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Hannah. And thanks to everybody for watching today and for hopefully watching over the next few days as well. Uh, last Friday, we didn't have a, a lunchtime live from the Socialist Party. We had the opportunity to co-host a rally for International Workers' Day with our comrades in the Socialist Party Scotland. And that had speakers from India, the US, from across Europe, uh, and is still available to watch on the Socialist Party Facebook page. The, the speakers were largely from the CWI, the Committee for a Workers' International, which is the world socialist organisation to which the Socialist Party is affiliated. And it's definitely worth, as I mentioned at the top of this uh, live event, of checking out their uh, website, socialistworld.net, where you can read socialist analysis, uh, socialist reports um, from around the world. Now, next week, we're, going to, we're planning to go live again, one o'clock on Friday, put it in the diary now. Um, and we're planning to go back, actually, to the questions of workplace and trade union organising, the issues of workers' control over safety uh, and, uh, and oversight as well over all the measures being taken in this crisis. And we hope that you will, will join us Friday, 15th of May, 1 o'clock. And I would add, though, um, you know, Hannah has referred to the struggles of, of workers now and the need to keep on building, the need to join a trade union, the need to fight for a mass workers' party. I would add that um, across the country, Socialist Party members have been playing really important roles, really leading roles, actually, in a number of those struggles over uh, safety against bit workers being forced to work in unsafe conditions. And in this week's Socialist, and in every issue of the Socialist, and on our website, you can read reports about workers organising in this week specifically, in transport, in the civil service, against being forced to work in, in unsafe uh, conditions. You can read frontline reports from the Postal Workers Union, from uh, BA workers as well, and also in the universities faced with enormous cuts as the crisis uh, evolves. So our members are playing those roles. Now, we're not a huge party, the Socialist Party, but we are effective, and we're particularly effective in our, in our roles in, in class struggle because our members look to the collective strength of working class people. That's how we were able, as the Socialist Party, then the militant, to lead the successful mass movement against the poll tax and against Margaret Thatcher and bring her down. Uh, in Liverpool City Council, that was another defeat for Thatcher, where the working class won £60 million and were able to build 5,000 council homes and make many other gains for the working class in that city. Today, the Socialist Party is growing at our fastest rate in a decade. And we hope that if you agree with what you've heard today in other Facebook Lives, what you've read on our website and so on, that you will join us, that you will help us to raise these socialist ideas because they are so absolutely vital uh, in the struggles that we're going into uh, it now and in the next uh, period. And we'd say the reason, one of the reasons to join is that being in a party that is confident of workers' potential power to change society, to run society, as Hannah has outlined here today, that helps to give you stamina and strength to stand up to the bosses, to stand up to the Tories and to build the movements uh, that we need. So if you're interested in joining, please get in touch, contact the organiser in your area or just email join at socialistparty.org.uk. Come to a Zoom meeting, discuss with us, or get in touch and have a phone call uh, discussion. Read our paper online, subscribe. Um, we're also, um, ho hopefully people might be able to post some of these links of how you do this. Also appealing to people that if you agree with what we've been saying here today, that you donate to the Socialist Party. We rely on our members and other working class people to support the running of our party. And obviously we're not able to do fundraising in the normal ways at the moment, so we are reliant on donations really. And just one more thing that I wanted to flag up before I shut up today is that uh, next Saturday, 16th of May, 
there's going to be a uh, national meeting for the National Shop Stewards Network. That is a meeting for all workplace activists, trade union activists, workers wanting to become activists or needing to become activists in their workplace, workers faced with uh, you know, unsafe situations, bosses uh, that are demanding unsafe working conditions and you need to get ideas from other workers about how to struggle. That meeting will take place at 3 o'clock on Zoom. You can get the details from the NSSN's uh, Facebook page uh, and hopefully you will join it and uh, join us on Friday as well. And that's all for today. Thank you very much for watching.